Well, uh, good morning. First of all, I'd like to thank for the invitation to be here today to present some of my recent findings on architectural policies and approaches across Europe. Namely, I will briefly present three research projects, one old one, one recently concluded, and one ongoing project. Following this structure, my presentation will be divided in three parts. First, I will start with the big picture, the results of a cross-national survey on architectural policies in Europe that was already briefly uh, referred by Bart, where I will also try to provide an updated panorama and a more recent overview because the survey was from 2012 and a lot of things have happened since then. Secondly, I will summarize the main findings of a small research project carried out last year for the government of Estonia, focus on spatial design leadership and the specific role of state architects across five states. Finally, and thirdly, I will briefly refer to ongoing uh, research project that started two months ago called Urban Maestro. Uh, the first study I would like to present here is the survey on architectural policy in Europe, which was carried out in the framework of my PhD research at the Bartlett, <coughs> together with the FAP in 2012. At the time, I was keen to understand how architecture has become widely adopted as an object of public policy in Europe and, uh, um, sorry, and uh, has a new policy domain at EU level, which I call the rise of architectural policies. In fact, in the last 40 years, there has been a remarkable growth in the number of countries that have adopted national architectural policies. Looking at the beginning of this movement, in the European panorama, has already been mentioned, France was the first country to adopt a national policy on architecture, but in a form of a law approved by the National Parliament in 1977. The adoption of the law was a very important milestone for the French architects, as it provided a foundation for a strong state cultural intervention in architecture. In the, context of, in the context of the Grand Projects in the 80s, it would lead to the establishment of several bodies, such as the Interim Ministry Mission for Quality in Public Construction, the MIC, in 1985. In that context, in the same year, has already been mentioned, um, sorry, has already been mentioned, uh, the European Council adopted its first policy directly aimed to architecture, the Directive of Architects in 1985. However, although the EU Directive recognized the public interest of architecture, its scope was mainly restricted to the freedom of movement of architects within the EU through the mutual recognition of diplomas and other formal qualifications in architecture has already been explained. In 1991, the Netherlands would adopt a pioneer policy document dedicated to architectural promotion. This new interministerial policy was an important landmark in the Dutch context, leading to the creation of several public institutions, such as the Berlag Institute and others. Since then, every four or five years, the Dutch Parliament has approved a new policy version. The last one, I think, is from 2017. Uh, see, uh, following the Dutch model, several other European countries started to develop comprehensive policies directly addressed to architecture and human design. Following this trend, in 2001, the EU Council, with the help of some lobby of the HFAP, decided to adopt the EU Resolution on Architectural Quality, encouraging the member states to promote design quality and raise awareness about the value of architecture and human design. However, the resolution failed to embrace the emerging sustainable development agenda portrayed some years after by the Leipzig Charter on Sustainable European Cities in 2007. Therefore, in 2008, the EU Council adopted a second policy on architecture with a reinforced object and aim, the Council Conclusions on Architecture, which advocated the integration of design quality in all policies and when commissioning public works. However, like all other EU soft policies, these two documents are not mandatory for the member states. They are informal and they are supposed to uh, influence and give, uh, how the name says, the soft policy so each member state follow it or not. So they are policy recommendations setting up general principles for future policy making. In this background, in 2011, I developed a survey together with the EFAP to review and assess the impact of the Council resolution and conclusions by surveying the political developments that the two EU policies may have generated in the individual member states since its adoption. 
A questionnaire was sent to governmental departments responsible by architecture within all the member states, and the report was published in 2012. The survey covered 33 countries, 27 member states, four official EU candidates, and two other countries, Norway and Switzerland. Uh, I don't want to repeat too much, but uh, I will briefly uh, refer to the survey. Among other aspects, it tried to identify the existence of a national policy on architecture, formalize in some type of official document, which could outline the government policy on architecture. As has already been mentioned, at the time of the survey in 2012, half of the countries had an official architectural policy, 14 stated that they were planning to develop one, and only five were not planning. However, after analyzing the different documents collected, it was identified three main types of policy approaches, legislation, comprehensive, and sexual policy. The comprehensive was adopted by the majority of the countries, legislation only in France and Sweden, and sexual policy only in Britain and Cyprus. In a chronological perspective, this has already been shown also, you can see that the development of the formal policies is still a relative recent phenomenon. Even so, it is possible to observe a remarkable growth in the adoption of this type of policy. Finally, the survey also described other initiatives, such as the Baukultur reports in Germany and Austria, which were not seen as a policy per se, but were addressing similar concerns. After briefly summarizing the survey main findings, now I will try to give an overview of the current panorama and of the architectural policies in Europe today, as eight years have passed, and as would expected, new things have happened. So one of the uh, recent changes in France, the Ministry of Culture has announced his intention to uh, approve a national strategy for architecture, and the official document was approved in 2015. In addition, five other countries have also adopted a national policy, Croatia in 2013 and Hungary in 2015. After a long process, Portugal has also approved its national policy in 2015, which has the particularity of combining architecture and landscape policy. Also, Czech Republic adopted its national policy in 2015, and Slovenia in 2017 in title Architecture for People. Finally, Austria has been debating and developing efforts in Baukultur for several years with several publications called Building Culture Reports, at least in 2006 and 2011, uh, and I think there's uh, a third one more recent. But in 2017, the Austrian Council of Ministers has adopted its first national federal guidelines on building culture. So looking at the progression of the architectural policies, all three types together, it is possible to observe that in 2011, this was the picture. With the updated situation now, in 2019, on the upper part, we can see the new countries, Croatia, Hungary, Portugal, Slovenia, and more recently, Czech Republic and Austria. Down below, we can see that France now has also a new color with a new comprehensive architectural policy. So basically, this is uh, uh, an attempt to update the, the data. This is not uh, an official uh, comprehensive information because no new survey was carried out again. So this was basically web research. Um, but uh, similar to Austria, the federal governments are also promoting Baukultur policy initiatives. In Germany, the initiative Architektur in Baukultur that started in 2000, leading to the creation of the Federal Foundation for Baukultur, who are the following speaker will introduce its aims, and who has also been publishing biennial reports. This later report, published in, 2000, published in 2017, 16, sorry, uh, and also Switzerland has also included Baukultur in, in its cultural policy, and is pursuing initiatives at national level. To add another layer, we have also uh, has public policy, it's not expressed only in policy documents. Uh, Valonia has also created a specific department in charge of architecture, Le Cellule Architecture. Italy has also a long-standing general direction of contemporary architecture, and Spain has also a, a, a long-standing general direction which includes architecture uh, in its remit. So, considering a broader view on public policy, we need to update this map uh, and the survey that the survey has picture. So, it would look something like this. We have more countries with a comprehensive policy. There is a special case of France that now has the mix of policies, the law that still remains active, and a comprehensive policy, uh, which we generally are called strategies. I've also included Germany and Switzerland in the sexual policy categories, 
due to the Bau Kultur initiatives. Also, I include Wallonia, Italy, and Spain in the sexual policies. And finally, I also changed the title of the slide to type of public policies on architecture as it has expanded its scope. This means that we need to include countries that do not have a formal policy per se, that is a policy document, but are also implementing policy instruments and aiming at the same goals. Looking across the policy documents, uh, I only have time to discuss one topic here, so I, I, I would like to have more time to look at the transversal themes. Uh, I, I bring you only the question of the scope, as it has been expanding. Aiming for integration, the policy started to include other related concepts that could better convey the interdisciplinary nature of the built environment, such as spatial design in the Netherlands, place in the UK, and bau kultur in the Germanic states widely expanding the scope to other disciplinary fields. Nevertheless, the difference in semantics does not undermine the same long-term goal of higher quality of life, namely through building bridges across state departments and achieve compromises between different design professionals and silos and stakeholders to accomplish better built outcomes. So I would like to go for a second piece of evidence that I bring you here today. Uh, mainly the main findings of a small research project that has just been published uh, last month, which was commissioned by the Estonian government and was uh, focused on spatial design leadership, namely the role, the instruments and impact of state architect teams in fostering spatial quality and the placemaking culture across five European states. Before starting, why does this research, research occur? The starting point for this research was the observation that many national governments and states have a public official titled the state architect or the government architect, chief architect, to provide design leadership and strategic advice to governments to improve the design of public buildings and promote better places. As an example, this is the website of the government architect of New South Wales in Australia. In fact, all Australian states have a state architect office. Interestingly, most of US American states also have a state architect office, including the federal government. This is the website of Tennessee State Architect Office. Although the state architects have long been established in several countries and states around the world, in several other European countries this is a relatively recent phenomenon. This is the case of Sweden, which just appointed its first state architect in 2017, no, 18, I'm sorry. Uh, in this context, it's relevant to clarify the contribution that a state architect or similar team and examine whether or not it can improve the role of the government in promoting high quality environments. Having this said, the following research questions were identified. Although it's starting to be recognized the importance of design leadership in enabling better places, in fact, little evidence is known on how special design leadership is put into practice in different social and political contexts. The research covered five European states, Ireland, Flanders, and Scotland, which have a state architect position, and Denmark and Vienna, which do not have such position, in order to examine and, compa and compare different ways of public authorities to exercise spatial design leadership. So after these, I will briefly describe two case studies, which I don't have time to describe all of the five, Flanders and Vienna one of each model, so one that have a state architect and the other that does not have, to see how does it work. I will start with Flanders, the northern part of Belgium. Inspired by the Dutch, the Flemish government decided to appoint its first Flemish government architect in 1998 to provide long-term support to regional and local government in pursuing a special design policy and promoting high-quality environments. Since then, every four years, the Flemish government submits, the Flemish government architect submits to the government a policy paper for a four-year funding program, the last entitled Places for People and Nature. According with its policy paper, the government architect, submit, uh, the government architect should stimulate and inspire Flemish architectural awareness as a way of increasing cultural responsibility on the part of authorities, industry, and the public. To do so, its core tasks are providing support and guidance to principals on public projects, contributing actively to the development and vision and reflection, communicating and raising awareness about topical issues, advising about gaps in regulation in relation to design quality, and providing opportunities for young architects. 
Its most important tool is the open call, which help public principals to select designers for assignments in areas of architecture, urban planning, public space, and infrastructure. As an independent expert and advisor to the government, the Flemish government architect is a bridge builder who approach projects from a cross-sectional perspective across policy areas. So it's uh, an instrument that opens every year where uh, local authorities can ask for the help of the state architect. It's a free service, they don't pay. They will prepare all the competition and the assignment for selecting the designer. So it's uh, a way of the, the Flemish architect directly influence the design governance process that is being delivered by the local authorities. Similar to the other case studies, the government, architect, the government also supports an architectural cultural institution dedicated to champion design across the Flemish stakeholders and society in general. Established in 2001, the Flander Architectural Institute, the VI, is responsible for the publication of the Flemish architecture yearbooks, organizes exhibitions and other activities that are aimed at making the general public more aware of architecture and urban design. Now, looking for a different approach, the research look at the state of Vienna. Within the state of Vienna, although there is not a state architect office in place, there is a department for architecture and urban design. Its mission is to develop the cityscape in a contemporary way, fostering a culture of placemaking and strengthening awareness and responsibility for design and living environment. To do so, the department has around 60 people working, providing urban design advice to other departments across the city department and state, because uh, Vienna has, is both a state and uh, city, uh, because it's a, a federal uh, city capital, um, and including advice about urban plans, architectural design of public buildings and public spaces in Vienna. In addition, there is also an advisory board for urban planning and urban design, an independent body that provides special design advice to the city council with the following tasks. It advises on the establishment and modification of zoning and development plans, assessment on the individual building projects if they have a strong impact in local cities' scape. Similar to Flanders, there is also an architectural center funded in 1993 uh, with the help of the state and city of Vienna, as most of probably of you know, the Architectural Center of Vienna is a cultural body dedicated to show and promote architectural and urban design to all the audience. So after examining the five states individually, the research looked across the case studies to uncover the similarities and difference between the different models to, uh, of spatial design leadership. The research cross-analysis, the data collected from the five case studies against, five, against six dimensions. I only briefly refer to three of those, as I do not have time to go to all of them here. And another five minutes and I'm, I'm finished. <laughs> uh, first point is that in all case studies have been pursuing an architectural policy for more than one decade, and some for almost 20 years. Focus on setting a design agenda, ambitions for better places. Although there are differences among the concepts used, the same concern about the quality of places and the quality of life are present in all of them, which means that these different conceptual approaches do not undermine the general aim of a more sustainable development. To push for a policy implementation, the first three states have appointed a state architect to provide special design leadership in general and improve the design of public buildings in particular through a diversified set of design policy tools and actions. So we have the first three, Sianne O'Connor from Ireland, Leo Van Brook from Flanders, and Ian Gilzen from Scotland. Uh, the, the remaining two, Denmark and Vienna, the system operates in a different way taking advantage of a, a robust cluster of actors and design advisory body. Although they do not have a state architect, they have what we can call a design champion, who provides spatial design leadership within its administrative structure, and in the case of Vienna, also at local level. Nevertheless, there are different conceptions of the role and the mission of a design champion. In this view, it is possible to place the five design, the, the state design champions along a spectrum from a more limited role to a more expensive role. At one extreme, the state design champions operate within and adds capacity to the statutory planning system. This is the case of Vienna or the Danish department. More proactively, on the opposite side of the spectrum, governments may appoint a design champion as a change agent or a change leader with a much more ambitious strategic and political role. This is the case of Flanders. 
In the middle, there is Ireland, who has both roles, because Sian O'Connor is, is a state architect of Ireland, but it's also a public official inside the public uh, office, uh, public works. So he has both roles. He's both a design advisor with a proactive leadership across government, uh, but he's also responsible for 100 architects working for him, designing all public buildings in Ireland. So it's a particular case because it still maintains the, 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 all of the designing of most of public buildings for public administration in the Irish government. Scotland, it's more on the left side of the spectrum, has it supervises the works of Architectural and Design Scotland, ADS, a national champion of special design, a very similar body to the old CAVE in England. To draw some conclusions, as I don't have time to go for all the study, on the role of special design leadership in process of design governance, as was, was seen, more and more countries are taking design increasingly seriously and developing sophisticated means to ensure that they provide leadership on this domain. A critical lesson is that special design policy or architectural policy or design build policy, however you want to call it, involves a public compromise to promote design quality as a corporative aim. As the research has shown, by appointing a state architect or a design champion is a direct way for the government to take leadership role in process of design governance. To deliver this policy ambition across public sector, governments should steer that direction and lead by example in fostering a place-making culture. Finally, I will just briefly introduce in one minute the last and third research project we just started last March, entitled Urban Maestro. This is a two-year research project, it just started. It's an initiative, a small consortium, comprising the United Nations Human Settlements Program, UN Habitat, uh, UCL, University College London, where, I, where I'm working on, the Brussels Baumister Maitre Architect, the BMA, supported by the European Commission. Urban Maestro looks at how European cities are being design, design, designed and financed, focusing on innovative ways of generating and implementing urban spatial quality. Urban Maestro project focused on soft power modalities of urban design governments, and those approaches where public authorities act in a semi-formal or informal capacity as enablers or brokers rather than regulatory or direct investment powers. Among several objectives, the project aims to map out the design governance landscape in all jurisdictions across Europe. To do so, a questionnaire was already sent to more than 150 organizations around Europe. I would like, if you would like to participate and provide information on the state of affairs on your jurisdiction, you can access the questionnaire until the 20th of May on the website of the project. Uh, here is the project contacts where you can find all the information. The first workshop will be right in the uh, next 13th of June in Valencia in the placemaking week. Well, to finalize, I hope I have provided some information for the following debate. As in all other public policies, a good sound evidence base is crucial to push for and improve the public policy's effectiveness. Thank you for your attention.